So we have um, two presentations today. The first presentation is by Richard Langenhog, and he is the visiting professor and an advisor at, to the Advanced Manufacturing Research Center Factory 2050. And Richard today will discuss the Internet of Trees and lead us on a personal journey of his own um, to understand some of the challenges of utilizing inter Internet of Things um, to monitor and assist the management of small woodlands. Um, and Richard, um, is a, a enthusiast of, of woods, and I think he will tell more about his own personal experience. And our second um, speaker today is John Booth. Um, and what John is trying to look at is trying to consider how much space soil is needed um, for new large data centers, and is this good use of agricultural land and reduce the amount of land that will be lost um, with rising sea levels. And John is a, I guess, describing as a um, sustainable data center evangelist. Um, he has been with the BCS Green IT for as long as I've been here, um, and he has his own um, independent uh, consultancy firm called Carbon3 IT, and I'm sure John will explain a little bit more about what he does um, and how and his firm and his, and his, areas, and his area of interest. So um, I'd like to take this opportunity now to pass um, the microphone over to Richard. Um, and Margaret, are you able to start Richard's presentation? And uh, Richard, are you are you um, are you ready to? Can you hear me, Alex? Take questions as they come. Could you confirm okay. that the, that it's come up on the screen? I'm um, watching. I'm watching. Yeah, I'm watching. Okay. So before you uh, press play, Margaret, uh, and thank you for that introdu introduction, uh, Alex. Let me just explain to. Um, uh, our attendees, what's what's going on here now? So, because of the, um, <laughs> the various problems many of us have with internet quality on uh, Zoom calls, Microsoft Team calls, and what have you, what I decided to do was with a few slides um, which are going to be presented to you. I've actually done an audio over the slides. So what Margaret is going to do is she's going to press play, and you'll hear my voice, and it'll take you through a series of slides, which is the journey of. Um, the Internet of Trees and what it's all about. As we go through it, if any of you have actually got any questions or you just want to ping me a chat comment, then please do so. But of course, you, we've got the, the panel at the end of all of this. So um, this is actually, not only is it being recorded for this AGM, but there is actually also a recording available uh, through, the, uh, through the BCS Green IT group if you wanted to um, take a copy of it uh, for listening to it some future date. So sort of settle back and enjoy. And uh, I hope you I hope you find the sort of the journey as interesting as I have found it over the last um, few years. So Margaret, if you could press play, please, and hopefully the um, the audio. Hello, my name is Richard Lanyon Hogg. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Sheffield. I'm also a member of the British Computer Society Green IT Specialist Group, and I'm also a woodland owner. Over the next quarter of an hour, I intend to provide an overview of a project which affectionately became known as the Internet of Trees, and also to ponder the question which arose in my mind as to whether the Internet of Things is really sustainable. As a sustainability project, back in 2005, some 15 years ago, um, myself and my, my wife, we bought a 40 acre wood from the Forestry Commission. It had been a softwood woodland and being recently felled, we had planted 22,600 deciduous saplings, mainly oak, ash, alder, downy birch and willow. And subsequently, we've had a further 3,000 saplings planted, which included tissue birch and some cognate. To give you an idea of the terrain of the wood, it's fairly flat, it does rise up a bit at the back. It's kite shaped, has a large lakelet and distant views over Cardigan Bay. Given the weather of West Wales, which generally is horizontal rain and gusty winds, we approached the local council and secured approval to build an off-grid lodge. We captured the rainfall into a holding tank via a stainless steel filter and via a further paper filter 
and UV sterilization unit, we have clean drinking water. Power is provided by a solar panel and Rutland Marine wind turbine. For heat, we have a wood burning stove and for all our waste, we have a composting system. So now we're truly isolated and off grid to tend to the wood. However, when we're not there, how do we know how the wood is? How does it feel? I realise that's a qualitative question, but with quantitative analysis, might it be possible to determine the health of a tree or a wood? So the idea was born, the internet of trees. Being a member of the Small Woods Association, I spoke to their team to test the appetite of what interest there might be in potentially using technology to monitor and report on the health of a tree or even an entire woodland. Discussions quickly progressed with the Small Woods Association, which then included the Forestry Commission Research Council and the London Wildlife Trust. With mounting interest, a workshop was held with all the interested parties, including amateur and professional foresters. This was back in 2017. At the workshop, a whole gambit of IoT technology was demonstrated. It included Arduino boards, boards from Intel, as well as Raspberry Pis. These boards were attached to a series of sensors and via a cloud system we had established, using simple analytics and the dashboard, we demonstrated how you could sense the environmental loss of a tree and present the resulting data. We explored the many different sensing options, as you can see on the right hand chart. So not only could we monitor temperature, humidity, moisture, illumination and electrical conductivity, but we could also sense such things as tree movement and airborne chemical attacks on the tree. The electrical conductivity was especially interesting as we later demonstrated how using conductive rubber we could detect the expansion and contraction of a tree trunk as the sap was rising and falling during the day. A little like monitoring human The workshop confirmed that there was an appetite to run a pilot. So we went ahead and designed a specific circuit board for the trial and working with the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in Sheffield, we had, we had designed and 3D printed a case to enclose the IoT circuitry. The 3D printed case was in the shape of a leaf, as you can see on the chart, and it was also found to be quite a tactile object. So during 2018 and 2019, we operated several live trials. We sensed up an oak tree, uh, silver birch trees and some willows, both single trees and those in the woodland setting. Where online communication was possible, we streamed the live data into a cloud hosted NoSQL database. The data was JSON structured for easy access by citizen scientists. And uh, we also provided for foresters the data via the dashboard. Using a data logging application, which we developed for a smartphone, offload data was also uploaded to the cloud to enable it to be merged with other synthetic data sets and public data sets such as weather data. As with the initial workshop, the pilot confirmed that using IoT technologies, it was possible to monitor the health of a tree and using mathematically scaling models, we could offer an informed view as to the health of the whole wood. But what lessons did we learn from the pilots? From a technology perspective, and as we all know now, the IoT is an accessible and affordable platform. The boards are cheap and very capable. The skills required to manipulate the technology to meet your own needs are easily accessible and doable for most individuals. I also felt that there is a growing acceptance across many groups of people that technology is now a way of life. And for amateur woodland owners such as myself, then why not use technology to monitor a tree or even a wood? From a field trial perspective, the lessons were quite different 
many woodland creatures took to the IOTR packaging, the Internet of Trees packaging, as one of its five-a-day meals. Quite often I'd find bits chewed off. Especially in a woodland setting, power was an issue. Yes, there has been tremendous strides made in battery technology, but if you're going to monitor a 40-acre woodland, we had calculated you need between 10 and possibly 20 IOTR packages. So whoever was responsible for maintaining the package would need to know precisely where they were in the wood. And remember, woods are constantly growing and changing and GPS signals are affected by wood and moisture. We did explore doing away with batteries altogether. Small solar panels were discarded though as they quickly became covered in slime and lost their effectiveness. We also considered energy from motion, but in the middle of a wood, there's little motion as at the edge of the wood, it acts as a baffle. And so the wind tumbles across the tops of the trees. So power was an issue and communications was also an issue. Offline data capture was fine. So long as the micro SD card remained intact, we found moisture, damp, frost and heat a constant challenge, which required changes and modifications in the Internet of Trees packaging to avoid microclimates within the unit. Online live streaming of data was fine if we had access to a Wi-Fi bubble provided by an on-site woodland cafe or recreational centre. As recently as last winter, we'd started to investigate using a low orbital satellite service to upload small 256 byte packets of data every 24 hours. So I felt that providing we could get the maintenance of the IOTR package resolved, we could provide a viable service to woodland owners with open, trusted and reliable data being made available to citizen scientists and other interested parties. But, and there's always a but, I just felt this whole approach wasn't sustainable. We're all familiar with the periodic table of elements. This chart illustrates how over the last 30 years, you can see the growth in the silicon technology industry's use of Mother Earth's resources. Before 1990, only six elements were employed. From 1990 to 2005, this grew to 14. Now, over half of all Earth's elements are used in materials innovation to satisfy our digital needs. Personally, I'm unable to use, justify using such an array of precious elements to simply monitor the health of a tree or a wood. The IT industry talks a great story about being sustainable. Really? The industry doesn't design for disassembly, whether that's hardware or software for that matter. Back in 2016, I spent six months volunteering at the National Museum of Computing, Bletchley Park. In one of their storage huts, which the public has no access to, is a history, a legacy of the IT industry, aisle upon aisle, row upon row of stuff, which was never fully utilized, only for it to be superseded by the next big thing, the next big way. The IoT is driving our planet, our only home, to be connected up with billions of devices. So to conclude, if we are to move to a more sustainable future, time is not our friend. We know what has been gained from technology, but what the Internet of Trees project has illuminated to me is that we're at a tipping point. The Internet of Things has the potential to be the next plastics disaster. Let us not lose what we and previous generations have enjoyed. More importantly, let us not forget what may be lost. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed uh, for playing that, Margaret. And I hope the, the quality of the, uh, the video and the audio uh, came through. Um, before I hand over to, to John for his presentation on data centres, just a 
just a small update. Uh, firstly, some uh, sad news. I don't know how many of you are aware of ash dieback, but there are one or two uh, ash saplings uh, in, in the woodland which have now succumbed to that um, virus, that pathogen, sorry. So uh, that, that's causing a bit of consternation. And we're also beginning over in that part of Wales to become slowly alarmed about the what's called the processional oak moth, which is now beginning to uh, sadly rear its ugly head in, in parts of southeast England. So um, the Forestry Commission Research Council are, are very sort of keen on uh, monitoring the, the, the march of these pathogens and what have you across woodlands. On the good news front, there is possibly the opportunity of actually monitoring woodlands in a slightly more sustainable way um, by actually using low-cost drones. And this is something which uh, I'm currently ex exploring at the moment by using uh, high definition video and photography at various times of the year to, uh, to, to try and undertake some analysis. So there's possibly a way forward through all of this. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. And I'll be around at the panel at the end to answer any questions which you got. So I'll now like to Alex hand over to John to talk about yes. data centers and the earth. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can everybody see the slide? Yes, we can. Yes, John. Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you, Richard, for uh, telling us about the Internet of Trees. It, it's a real shame that it, it didn't achieve what you'd hoped for. Um, uh, anyway, let's move on. So, data centers in the earth. Okay, come on. Oh, right. Okay, so I'm, my name is John Booth, and as Alex previously said, I'm the MD of Carbon Free IT Limited, and uh, I work with um, making data centres more s sustainable and energy efficient. And uh, these are the sort of things that I get up to in my spare time. Uh, I'm just going to shift a few windows here. So, uh, right, uh, let's next one. So firstly, what is a data center? So we, we, we talk about um, data centers uh, in a kind of quite nebulous fashion. And um, some people talk about them being cloud sites. So uh, what I can say is that the data centers and the cloud does not live in the cloud. Um, and this is uh, Cloud Blades 9, which of those of a certain age will realize that this is the main airbase for the angels in a 1960s uh, animated puppet series called Captain Scarlet. Um, uh, but what they are is home digital infrastructure. If anything, they are not the cloud, they're fog. They sit on the ground. Um, and they are homes for servers, network and storage. And they need electrical systems to provide electrical energy. Uh, they may need a cooling system. Uh, they usually use have interruptible power supplies, UPS and generators, and of course they'll have connectivity via telecommunications and network cabling systems, and then they'll have building integrity systems such as fire, very early smoke detection apparatus, suppression systems, security and access control, uh, and then over all of that there will be a, a service wrap of policy processes and procedures to maintain the, uh, the systems within, and they kind of look like this. And their purpose is to deliver digital services to internal and external customers should be at the lowest possible cost based on your organizational risk profile. Now, going to move on to uh, data center energy and environmental impact. Uh, and you may have noticed that some of these slides are actually um, don't really kind of contribute to our debate, but this is because I've cobbled together a series of slides from a number of presentations that I've done over the last year or so. Um, but there is a, um, an issue with data centers in terms of land use, rare earths mining impacts, and uh, e-waste in soil contamination. So those are the three things that I'm going to be concentrating on um, for the next 20 minutes or so. So has anybody heard of Doggerland? So Doggerland is 
basically the area around the UK um, it was around in just before the end of the last ice age and it was a very productive area uh, but as we can see the only real bit that's left is a dogger bank which uh, people can go out and uh, stand on and there are some certain places um, just like the Thames estuary where you can also stand on this was productive areas and as we can see there were three main um, Inund inundations of this area. So one 16,000 years ago, one 8,000 years ago, uh, and one around 7,000 years ago. And um, basically it's all gone now. It's all gone. And basically it's a result of climate change and its related effects. So what about today? Well, according to my research, three quarters of what are defined as mega cities which include New York, Tokyo, Cairo, etc., are beside the sea. And it's been estimated that 80% of humans live within 60 miles of the coast and the sea level rise of 10 meters would be catastrophic. And we'll see why later on. So land use for data centers. What, 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 you know, what are we looking at here? So for enterprise, which is data centers that are owned and operated by the same entity, there are four main areas. So we have edge, which is small server rooms, and these can be remotely managed. We can have hubs, which are slightly bigger, small server rooms and could possibly be off floor in a, in a organizational building. And we have main and disaster recovery data centers, which can be rooms, floors, or separate buildings. And then we have cloud, hyperscalers, the Google, the Facebook, the Amazon, the uh, type, well, Facebook device there. Uh, and this is more like, likely to be a campus environment. And then for co-location, we have edge, so the small server rooms, mobile towers, and potentially some containerized uh, facilities. We've got telecom mobile, so mobile towers, especially in 5G, which is, as Richard said earlier, is, is part of the IoT. Telecom, fixed, exchanges and micro exchanges. In fact, BT did have a quite a large portfolio of micro exchanges which were scattered around the, the UK. Uh, and in the last 10 years or so, they've managed to sell them all, which was probably a bit of a strategic error because they would make perfect edge locations now. City sites for location, which can have multiple customers in. And then we have cloud, uh, which are CDM providers, Metro Hub sites, which are extensions of the cloud hyperscale environments to provide content delivery networks. And then we have small cloud operators. And entirely likely that some of your data centers could be contained in rooms like this, or they might even look like that, which is a pretty bad example. And here, uh, and then we have bigger ones that may be like this, or sometimes like that or like this, and these are extreme examples of, of the genre. Um, but nowadays with the hyperscale, we saw this um, picture earlier on, but this is, uh, that's the inside of Facebook at Lulia in Sweden. And this is the outside. And they're clearly building phase three in this area here. And, and you can see that this is a vast building and they've had to cut down all the trees in order to uh, to put it in uh, and this is an, a similar site in Fort Worth uh, and as you can see it is it's a, these are huge campuses many hectares of, of land are being used for provision of the hyperscalers and currently there are around 450 of these sites globally and there's about another 120 under construction there is no current data on the amount of land that is being used for data centers. But to give you a recent example, um, one of the hyperscalers was planning to build um, a, a hyperscale campus in the Netherlands. And this has triggered quite a bit of um, poor press for them in, in the local media. Uh, but it's a huge site. Uh, and that is prime agricultural land. It's land that's been previously reclaimed from the Zyder Z uh, and used to be home to uh, 
sheep and um, crops, and now is going to be devoted to data sets. But I think there is an issue. It's not a well-known issue, but I think that's going to be start to be prevalent. People will be asking questions why uh, largely American organisations are coming over to Europe and buying up vast tracts of land and then sticking these energy in fire-breathing dragon data set on them. Okay, so now to the question of period elements used in ICT. And Richard touched on this, but I want to go into it in a little bit more detail. So this is an abandoned rare earth mining site in China. This is child miners in the Congo. Uh, and this is a picture of personal mining, which is going on to get these rare earths. And this reminds me very much of the early days of gold mining in South Africa, where, as we can see, we have uh, basically all and sundry coming along and basically digging out the land, all individual companies. And I think we need to remember that back in the 1900s, uh, Consolidated Gold was actually the organisation that was created from all of the artisanal miners because of uh, land collapses. In this photograph here, we can see a system of pulley walls that was basically taking people and the products out from pillars of um, plots and stakes and claims that had been made. So basically, some organisations were able to get a lot of labour in and they would dig down on their plate and they would leave the surrounding claims high and dry. And this led to uh, lapses of... Um, of those elements. And this is uh, another picture of period. So getting back to Richard's periodic table, as he was quite correctly said, before the 1990s, there were six elements used. Uh, and then from 1993 to 2005, we have more elements being used. And this is the amount of elements that are being used today, which uh, is quite alarming. <clears throat> OK. so. Just to give you an example, and this is 2009 data. So for one PC we made, take 240 kilograms of fossil fuels, 21 pounds of chemicals, 1500 liters of water, contains over a thousand different materials for one PC. In 2009, 367.8 million PCs were manufactured. And that in 2008, the number of PCs on the planet exceeded 1 billion units, which meant that in its production, there had been 240 billion kilograms of fossil fuel, 22 billion kilograms of chemicals, and 1,500 billion litres of water. Now, this data is old, but there is no reason to think this has changed substantially, and there can be more research is needed. For servers, which are located in data centers, uh, and what I used was those previous slide figures and multiplied them by three to count for server. So these, these might be slightly off. There was 27 million in use in 2009. Uh, and effectively, you can see them as they are. Total fossil fuels used in computing to date, and that was in 2009, 24.1 billion tons. And that's estimated. And that would have been the amount of fuel required to run Drax, which is a power station in the north of England, for 2,400 years. And Drax provides 7% of the UK generation capacity in 2009. It's actually slightly less than that, it's about 3.5. And they have, over the last uh, years or so, converted their boilers to run a mixture biomass and coal. Okay, so this brings us on to the question of e-waste, um, which as we can see from these photographs is, is quite alarming, uh, especially as we think that there is recoverable elements within, within IT. So, from this paper that I discovered recently with sciencedirect.com, uh, studies conducted at Chinese, Indian, Nigerian, and Ghana and waste, e waste sites found large concentrations of heavy metals, organic contaminants such as PDB, 
PDEs, PTBs and policy aromatic hydrocarbons in the air, the dust, the soil, the vegetation and more alarmingly in the blood of the workers and residents on and in the vicinities of these sites. And you can click on that link to get um, more information about that problem. So what is e-waste? E-waste is basically temperature exchange equipment such as refrigerators, freezers, air conditioning and heat pumps. It screens and monitors, so televisions, monitors, laptops, notebooks, tablets, it's lamps, fluorescent lamps, high intensity discharge lamps, LEDs, it's large equipment, kitchen equipment such as washing machines, clothes dryers, dishwashers, electric stoves, large printing machines, copying equipment and PV panels, small equipment such as vacuum cleaners, microwaves, ventilation equipment, toasters, kettles, etc. And then finally, we've got small IT and telecommunications equipment, which includes mobile phones, mobile positioning system, GPS devices, calculators, personal computers, telephone. And there has been a vast increase in the amount of e-waste that's being generated. Uh, this e global e e waste monitoring 2020 report to record 50, they, they made a mistake here, which is why I have scrubbed it out, but 59 mega, million tonnes of predicts a rise to 81 million tonnes by 20. That's a 21% rise in five years. And, and, and from this, we have uh, these types of uh, problems. So we're, we're, we're damaging the soil, we're damaging the air in those locations, and we're damaging the water to leaching uh, and the way that these are being recycled. Uh, they, they basically cause multiple contamination problems. So now I'm going to do a quick switch of change of focus and get back to Doggerland, climate change, and the melting of the ice caps in the Antarctic and Arctic. Oh, let me take that back one will cause um, sea level rise. Now, this is from flood.firetree.net, and it shows a seven meter rise in sea level. And as you can see, most of the Netherlands is under the waves. And if we were to zoom in to London, you can see that all those data centers in Docklands uh, and the Tunnel Avenue are now effectively uh, in underwater, not underwater, because they majority of the access at points and they're uh, underwater, and you'll need a boat to get to them. Uh, and in Amsterdam, the, uh, the problem is even worse. As you can see, there's only small areas of the Canal District and parts of Arlem area that are still above water. Now at 60 meters, which is probably the complete melting of the Arctic ice cap, you see that the problem gets a bit worse. Denmark effectively disappears. Berlin is uh, also in the flood zone. Hanover in Germany, Bremen. Uh, London is probably no longer a viable city to live in. Even Cambridge and Peterborough. Norwich is underwater. Hull, Lincoln's on the edge. Uh, and where I live in Warwick, uh, currently, we're 80 metres away from the sea, but sea levels rise by 60 metres. Warwick will become a beach resort, and this fjord that will come up from the Severn Valley. Now, obviously, this would be catastrophic climate change, but if we think back to those, the area of Doggerland, and there was three distinct catastrophic changes that basically wiped out Doggerland completely. The last one was the third great melt of the glaciers from the last ice age. And we know from geographic surveys that have been conducted of the English Channel that there is still scouring where the seabed has been brought down to the bedrock in the English Channel. So we know that that is from a catastrophic event. And we cannot wait really to, to address this problem because it could happen at any time. So this is why it's a bit of a problem for London and, and uh, Amsterdam is because these are the core locations on the European core fibre and internet network. 
this is where all the communications cables terminate uh, that come transatlantic uh, from London and uh, Amsterdam. I'm not suggesting that these are the only points. There are points that could be used that come into Norway. There has been some considerable movement um, and installation of new cables to account for the Norwegian and Nordic data centers that have been being built there in the last 10 years or so. So what can we do? Mitigation actions that we can do. Now, obviously, there's not a lot we can do about land. Uh, you just need to make sure that you build them in the places where you should build them uh, and outside of flood uh, problems or any potential flood problems. That, this is quite interesting because I know that Tech UK have been asked by the government uh, to do a survey of their data center operators in the UK, obtain where they're located and that they should do a flood risk assessment. So that would be quite interesting to see what will come out of that. But um, we talk about the code of conduct, and this is more for energy efficiency, but in the data center building uh, section, part eight of the code of conduct, it, it does talk about putting your data center in a place where you which is optimum, and the EN 5600 series of data design, build, and operate standards also have a section on where you should um, locate your data centers and the sort of feasibility studies in before construction. The, um, we need to uh, worry about that. Um, and these are obviously some slides that I've kept from other bits and pieces. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shut down there. Um, thank you for listening, and I'm gonna send you back to Alex. Um, and if any questions, please feel free to ask them. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard and John. Um, so that draws to conclusion of our presentations for this evening. Um, I'd also now like to take the opportunity to open the floor for conversations and questions. So firstly. Um, do we have any questions from the uh, the people on the call, um, specifically you, or John or Richard? Can't hear me. Okay, why is that then? Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you, Alex. I was just wondering, Alex, do you want the uh, attendees to use the, the questions section uh, or the um, chat? So, yes, if, if you can ask, that would be good. If, uh, questions or um, if the... Margaret, the can they actually ask questions on the call as well? Yes, we can. Uh, if they put their hands up, we can open their microphones. Okay, that'd can be problem. Can you see the AGM screen? Yeah. All ah, right. Oh, we want to get rid of that, don't we? With any luck. Trying to dispose of. Not very successful. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how this bit works. I've not tried this before. Uh, Alex, I think I've sent made you up as presenter. John. Oh, you want me to uh, come off? Okay, hold on a moment. Uh, could, could you come uh, come off the? Press the stop stop sharing. Who do you screen. wish to be to make? Who do you wish to make make the presenter? Alex? Uh, yes, I'll stop doing my one. Uh, share screen. So I think I think we're okay if we can get Alex now as presenter. Um. I think Alex, Richard, and John, you should all be able to should be shown. Okay. So can you? Can you... Why can't I hear you? I have to admit my audio is completely gone now. Can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Um, John, if we uh, make you presenter for the moment so you can close your screen. Okay. Uh, which is just cross uh, cl clicking on that little white triangle or little white square rather in the set in the sharings. Okay, I've done that. 
So I think now, are we? Oh Have you got my screen up? Can I ask what screen everybody's looking at? Unfortunately, anyone. Hello. Yeah, I can uh, hear I can... you. Oh, sorry, this is not working for me. Ah, you see you, Mark. Yes, uh, can we bring John Hi. and Alex on? Uh. Sorry about this. I'm afraid it's my rather no, bad technical. No, yeah, I can see you, John. Right, fantastic. The only person we have, no, the only person we have no. is Alex. I think, I think we've lost Alex. Okay, well, whilst we're waiting for Alex, Margaret, why don't we um, open it up to the attendees if they've got any questions? Definitely. There's a hand up from um, John. Uh, uh, Salva, is it? John, yes. can, can, we can hear you, hopefully. Yeah, hello. Do you have a question or a comment? I, I do. I do have, uh, first of all, a big thank you, uh, Richard and John. Uh, I'm, I'm an academic from Cranfield, so uh, I've been looking at this uh, issue on green data for a while as the uh, fourth industrial revolution is unfolding. And uh, I am I encouraged to hear what you had to say. Uh, we've done some research where we calculated or rather estimated the carbon footprint of a gigabyte of data, uh, which I can share with you at some point, um, uh, based on the current energy generation profile. My question to you is this. Um, yeah, and John, you mentioned about some standards, but at the moment, um, I think uh, what we see, and I'd like your views, both Richard and John, on this, uh, we see that uh, some big names, household names, <laughs> that people know, are marking their own homework when it comes to talking about themselves and how green they are. Um, and every time one of those 120 centers that you're talking about, and we know, we know the SDG ambitious targets, we haven't heard of anybody. They, every time there is a license requirement for building one of those things, there needs to be some rules as to, for example, the energy needs to be from renewable clean sources. There is no such movement. Is there such movement? And, and the concept of green data, people think data is free. And we like to say uh, data is energy. How, are you seeing any movement on uh, policy push towards that way? To green data, if you have, if you want a license for a new data Hello? center, you have to have a, a clean uh, source of energy. That's it. That's my question. Hi, um, John, I'll, I'll answer your question for you. Um, OK, so about 10 years ago, Greenpeace started publishing something called How Clean Is Your Click or How Dirty Is Your Data? And whilst this was US based research, um, it, it did actually impact across the whole of the sector professional data center sector. So when I when I say that, I mean the co-location types, the, the guys that would look after other people's equipment in data centers and some of the hyperscalers such as Facebook, Google, Amazon, uh, Interaction, et cetera. Now they have, they were, they were stung by the criticism that Greenpeace levied on them. And, and this is why you see uh, the likes of Google and Amazon reporting 
their uh, renewable energy quotient in their energy mix. Uh, and they are actively participating in something called uh, purchase power agreements. So basically what they're doing is they are buying up uh, renewable energy uh, mixes from via green tariffs. Right. Hello. In some cases they are and in some cases they are actually investing in renewable energy schemes. So Google has uh, a number of solar uh, wind farms they invest in. But these are not the energy that they use. So that it, it's basically it's a big offsetting exercise that they're up to. Uh, and, and you're quite correct, there is no uh, adequate reporting requirements within the industry. Uh, and, and, and this causes us problems because it basically gives, uh, because of the lack of data, and, I, and I, I did have a couple of slides about this, but I took them out. Um, nobody knows exactly how much energy is being used globally for data centers or ICT in any way, shape or form. The only real data we have is uh, estimated data and surmised data. And we have one in the UK called the Climate Change Agreement for Data Centers, which was started in 2014 at the beginning of the data center and via the mechanism of Tech UK's policy unit, the wonderful Emma Frost. And she put pressure on government and lobbied government. Uh, and at the time, it was the Department for Energy and Climate Change, and now it's Bagley's. But effectively, there are an incentive for data centers to reduce their energy consumption via the climate change levy and not being on the TRC and exempt from the TRC. They, I think they also get, there is another incentive as well they get, but in return, they have to, on an annual basis, uh, or every three years actually, provide data to base for analysis. What that told us was that in the last reporting period, which was 2017, and then the third one is due imminently, that the commercial data centers in the UK used 2.89 terawatt hours of that year, which represented 0.79% of the UK's total generation capacity. Right. Uh, can I interrupt for a moment? John, um, could you just yep. move your microphone very slightly? Yeah. Is that better? That's better. Yeah, John, I've also got a, a, a comment I'll make uh, following your comment on this as well. I'll give it a different spin. Okay, um, so we don't know exactly how much energy is being used, but we do have a lot of estimations and some scare stories that have been put out by various research organisations, and for what purposes, I don't know. Global energy use has been estimated at one, two, or three percent, depending on who you talk to. And some people will tell you that it's um, the, the equivalent to the aviation industry. Uh, this was pre-COVID, obviously, because I should imagine their energy use has uh, substantially dropped in the last year or so. Um, but is there a push to do something about it? Yes, there is, because people are getting increasingly frustrated with. Um, some articles that have been written by the press. Indeed, I was mentioned in the Sunday Times uh, on the 29th of November um, in, in a Silicon Valley's Dirty Little Secret article, which you can get online if you can get through their firewall. But we know that the data centers industry in the EC is under a very uh, a very watchful eye, and we know that they're going to be start starting to find out what's going on. They're really, really worried about energy consumption related to data centres, but they're more focused on the actual reuse of energy from um, waste heat reduction, uh, reducing the waste heat, or or using and capturing that waste heat into things like heating systems. But that's a whole not another story. What I think will happen, and it's and I've we've been getting some interesting assignments from people that I wouldn't have expected to get them from. But effectively, to build a hyperscale data center is going to cost you anywhere 
upwards of $200 million. So these are significant investments. People have to go to the finance houses to get it. And the finance houses have basically, they've come late to the data center party, but they are now adopting what we call ESG. So that's environmental, social, and government criteria that a data center operator will have to provide information to the investment house how he's going to do stuff in the environmental, social, and governance areas before he. And I think what you'll see is those ESG people will be starting to say, we want you to publicly report. If you don't, you're not getting them. It's as simple as that. And I think all of those guys together will be able to put some pressure on and we will get some good data. Over to you, Richard, because I've spoken enough. John, you're breaking. You were breaking up a bit at the end. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll be very brief um, in terms of a comment to that question. I was just I was just uh, looking at a, a, a small paper I, I wrote recently, and I'll just read an extract from it. It says the industry knows it needs to be sustainable, but there's a lot of greenwash spinning around so the broader question is if the industry truly knows what it is to be sustainable why isn't it happening fast enough perhaps because sustainable is not a regulated term like free range so it leaves the industry free to interpret as it sees fit applying it as it sees appropriate without any legal recourse so what will it take for an industry to operate within its planetary boundaries, as John was touching upon? Um, the, the, the industry has been taking the lead on the discussion around sustainability, creating a glut, I would say, of misinformation. And until the consumer and governments are better informed and demand greater transparency, regulation and legislation, I think personally, the industry will continue as it sees fit. So let's just accept that no one company can be, be perfect, but let's not call something sustainable if it isn't. And I think this is the problem which the industry has got. Too much greenness wash, too much spin, and there's no proper regulation of the terms. Sorry, back to you, Margaret. Um, is, uh, I, mean, I think we've got Bob there. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Did you want to add any points to this? Well, my only concern was around the code of conduct and how far that required reporting on a common basis of sustainability impacts. Okay. Um, Do you know where we are on that, John? Okay. Look, uh, is uh, Alex going to have lost him? I think there might be a question from uh, uh, coming up from uh, Ted uh, Pulfer. Yes. Um, right. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear? Okay. Right. So, Ted, um, I'll, I'll contact you separately out, outside of this, but um, I, I don't think we need to panic immediately, to be honest. But it's more of the um, my point there was that if we do have a catastrophic rise in sea level obviously these facilities will be some jeopardy but regardless of what happens even if you did build a big center Sorry, John, we've lost you. right can you hear me now Sorry, volume that's better completely all right okay sorry about yeah, this keep um, going. Okay, so um, now whilst I'm not saying that data centers should all find and seek higher ground, um, I think the core point of this is is that the existing tabling infrastructure will terminate and go to the places that are going to be underwater. We can effectively write off uh, a lot of those cable landing stations. They'll have to be realigned. They'll have to be hardened against um, flooding aspects, and it, it may be wise to to consider building buildings on stilts uh, in order to to keep those operational elements 
you know, out of harm's way. Um, personally, if I was an American data center investor and asked to go to Amsterdam and build something, I'd have to question the rationale for that because we know, I mean, that in fact, areas around Schiphol, Schiphol Airport itself is already six meters below sea level and it's only kept out through the fantastic engineering that the Dutch do on their sea wall. Um, but as I said, this, this, this is not going to be a gradual process. This would be catastrophic. And, and we, you know, it's going to be a problem. But then if we're going to have a catastrophic sea level event, I don't think the last thing we're going to be thinking about is data centers. Yeah, until we can't. Thanks, John. Cheers. Any other points, Richard, you'd like to add on to that? No, nope. uh, that's a a good one, John. It's uh, as you said. Well, once we see an increase in sea surges and uh, people heading for the hills, I think uh, <laughs> data centres will be the last concern on our list. <laughs> True. And, can you hear me? Uh, yes. You can hear me. Did you hear that point? Because I think it's um, it's it's quite important that uh, we look at. The change in sea level around the world is going to be different. It's not going to be a homogeneous rise in sea level around all our coasts. Um, I think there's a recent oceanography study that gives quite a range of increases due to the ice cap melt. So that might be something to feed into the discussion. Certainly, there's the, the new um, piece of tool that's been made available, so you can put in your own postcode and you can actually yeah. predict ahead the various weather conditions, et cetera, in summer and in winter. And I, I know that uh, this week I put in my postcode and uh, I was very depressed hmm. with the outcome. I think the challenge, uh, Bob, uh, I think one of the challenges out of this is that if you look at the behavior of society whether it's at an individual level or community wider community and what have you there is this sense that um, a lot of this technology is produced for the good of the individual it's produced for the good of society but we've lost we've somehow disconnected our thinking as uh, as to whether it's actually good for the planet and a lot of this technology is not good for the planet as, as john has shown in his talk and as i've shown in mine the the call which we're making on mother earth to satisfy our needs and the the resulting waste which arises from that isn't getting any better it's getting worse so for all of the platitudes which we see from global corporations uh, let's call it greenwash let's call it sustainability wash Things are going, things are not improving. Um, my concern is I think a lot of our thinking, I think we are being cognitively hijacked to behave in particular ways, which benefits enormously many of these, you know, social media companies and what have you, and many of the sectors, but it's just not good for us further, further down the line. And I think that's a challenge which we have, you know, there are wider issues societal issues which are in play here. Yeah. Thing is, uh, yeah, Bob, just just to follow that up, I think one of the issues is how do we value that environmental impact in assessing the price of a product and the cost of it um, and way in which the environmental impact is exposed um, in a quantitative way, because I think that's only when people will understand what that impact is it's all very well saying you know this is this is good for the environment or this is this is going to be hitting the impacting the environment badly it's getting some scale onto that and some measurement process to bring it home to people yeah yeah and i think there are uh, increasingly bob i think there are increasingly more people who are making an effort to be more informed as to the environmental impact of the choices which they're making 
Uh, however, in an effort to become more informed, I think they are facing an ever increasing amount of false and contra contradictory data. Mm. Um, and it comes back to the point I was making earlier in that this whole term of sustain being sust sorry, sustainable is not a regulated term, as many other yeah. terms are. And I think companies and governments have a it's given them a carte blanche to interpret that as they see fit based on the circumstances which they see before them um so but the i suppose the litmus test of all of this uh when we think about the oceans and we think about thermal mass expansion and we think about acidification of the ocean when we think about the loss of the ice sheets and what have you and the the microplastics which are entering the ocean are things getting better and satellites unless they're calibrated incorrectly don't lie and what the satellites are telling us through various techniques is that things are getting worse things are not getting better so i think there is a there is a an urge by many people a desperate need to to be more informed to do good but it does require not just words but the concerted effort of governments to actually make that difference to enforce that change and i think there's a lot of hope riding on the next uh, cop session i think is there any actually, other point that you'd like well, to make there's no questions coming up at all or no well, I've just, yeah I, margaret i've got um i'm just reading through an article that's just been published by data center knowledge and it's um talking about is it says it says europe edges close to the green data center laws it says while all options are still on the table ideas for tougher measures have been put on the back burner and and there's one one art one part of this article that i just want to raise because i think it's um it, it goes back to the we don't know how much we're using uh, debate that i mentioned in my um question so i'm just trying to find it this is um it is from a report that was issued a couple of weeks ago which was an, an eco cloud initiative and i'm afraid that again they they really haven't done their homework so this said um by 2025 total data center energy consumption in europe will increase 21 percent on 200 2018 levels when data centers consumed 2.7 percent of all electricity in europe our computer will be responsible for 60% of all energy consumed by data centers in 2025, nearly doubling the proportion size since 2018. A mutual official said the research was a breakthrough because it was the first clear estimate of data center energy consumption in Europe. It showed how existing previous forecasts of data center energy consumption differ wildly and called their veracity into question. Its own cautious forecast ventured that Europe's data center energy consumption will reach 92.7 terawatt hours in 2025, about three quarters as much as electricity as the whole of Ireland consumed in 2018. Right. Um, I would say that's wildly off, but this is the problem. Too many people. Uh, using too many different sources to come up with a figure. And what's really needed is some sort of legislation to determine reporting aspects, at least to be specific to the data center industry and, and all others as well. So if you're running a big organization and you've got multiple data centers that you're an enterprise class, I really believe that we have to separate their overall energy. Um, data center energy out from their overall energy to get a real handle on it because otherwise it's going to make really bad decisions such as this what and is that we're going to keep some of the more radical uh, options on the back burner uh, and that's never going to get us where we need to get to yeah i i, I, I share your concerns on that john because when I look at, uh, for example, the fourth industrial re revolution, so we're talking about the digitization 
of engineering and uh, manufacturing, the digitization, well, the acceleration of the digitization, whether it's retail sector, whether it's uh, finance or what have you, or even the public sector. Uh, behind all of that are supply chains. And what COVID has taught us is that supply chains, which were fairly streamlined for just in, uh, just in time, have now become just in case. And I think trying to persuade the supply chains, for example, to use solar energy for power or to source and work with low impact materials will require a new persistence and it will require a lot of patience and it will require a new investment. But unfortunately, John, you know, this will take time. And I think as, as Bob alluded to, you know, the, the view of some environmentalists and the climate scientists is that time is no longer our friend. And um, we, we can't afford to wait another few years for some sort of breakthrough on, on regulation or legislation. Changes have to be put in place sooner rather than later. Yeah, as I said to somebody a couple of weeks ago, I think Jeannie is out of the bottle now. Um, yeah, it was actually John Summers from um, Lily Obis Rise. He basically said, you know, should um, should we look at personal carbon counts and should it be the individual that, that limits their use? I mean, you know, there was a, a Channel 4 dispatches program a couple of weeks ago that talked about streaming video and um, uh, all those sort of digital devices and using, you know, storing pictures that you've taken on your phone in, in various cloud options and how much energy that's taken. Uh, but it is, you know, you're not going to get, you can't change people's behaviour without taxing them. And, you know, really, I think Ian Bitterlin from um, the ex-head of the D DCSG said, you know, he was having a Christmas dinner a couple of years ago and said to his children, how much would you pay per month to keep to have unlimited access to your uh, to your cloud photographs? And and they, they said, well, but why should we? We're already paying that in, in the monthly fee. They kind of capped it at ten pound a month. Now, when people are prepared to pay ten pound a month um, to, to look at their photographs, um, but the argument's lost. Yeah, the genie is out of the bottle. So if if people won't change then we have to change the behavior of the organization, how they're delivering their data, their storing on behalf of customers uh, in, in a more eco-friendly and energy efficient way. And we're a long way from there, I think. Well, can I, can I just uh, be a little bit of a devil's advocate here? Because I agree with what you're saying, but what troubles me in my mind, which is why I'm being a bit of a devil's advocate to myself, is if you look at the way in which global corporations have behaved in terms of their uh, their fiscal their fiscal policies on how they actually move uh, monies to jurisdictions where the tax wrappers are much more favorable for the corporation as a whole and then they then park money in particular countries until tax regimes alter in their, either their home country or in other countries and they then move the monies around so they they, 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 they're not, they're not breaking the law. They're just being incredibly efficient through paying huge amounts of monies to accountants and lawyers to figure these, these, these things out. Do you not feel that if we move to um, a situation where there is a desire to, to begin to carbon tax companies, that they'll just simply change their globalization policies and trade policies, which have so far encouraged them to behave in particular ways around outsourcing? So in other words, you know, we feel we may be able to uh, move towards some oversight and perhaps even some sustainable ownership of their supply chains, but actually they'll just play the game as they have done with monies over the last few decades. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree, not, Richard, and I think that's interesting. I think one um, of the issues is giving them an incentive to do that change um, and some way of actually making it valuable to them, um, whether that is through consumer pressure or uh, political regulation. Um, I think it's only when they feel that um, it's going to give them a return on their bottom baseline, as you say, Richard, really, 
that they're going to take any notice, which is a sad well, thing to say, really. Yeah, I mean, what I mean, so do do we, this as a society, should we actually hold out more hope for demand side changes or supply side changes? I think uh, our engineering is 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 on the demand side, really. It's it's through the PR, it's through the the exposure you can give to bad practice that could demolish a company's um, revenue. But because we don't, I think the, the challenge then which we have is how do we overcome the greenwash? Because the the term yeah. sustainable is not regulated in any way whatsoever. You know, even a Scotch egg is regulated. A, you know, molten mulberry pork pie is regulated, but the term sustainable isn't. And so we suffer enormously from corporations' interpretation of that. Yeah. So it, it's a and dead this, term. This, this, We've yeah. lost John. I think. I've turned my camera off, but um, hopefully you can still hear me. Yeah, um, still hear you. There, is, yeah. Yeah, there is another question that's come in, and it's um, is ESG another big scam or is it a savior? Now, um, I can't go into too much detail, but um, we've been approached to to assist a couple of companies that are providing ESG bonds um, to potentially data center operators. Now, obviously, my my report to them will be uh, on a guidance side of things of what they can do, and I can put some recommendations in. But actually, I think we need to look at this in a wider context. Um, the climate emergency isn't going away. The governments are committing to net zero targets, uh, and there has to be transition routes to get there. And there is huge opportunities in. Uh, all sectors in order to, uh, to, to to achieve this, but we have to take the opportunity. And if that means that we need to reconsider how we have corporate governance, how companies operate, then I think that's gonna have to happen. I would have, if you'd have asked me this question two years ago, I'd have said, I think that's gonna be very difficult. But I think with Joe Biden in the White House in, in a couple of months time, He's already committed to serious uh, climate change packages in the US, and that will then impact the manufacturers of ICT kit in the US, or it will definitely those those incumbent tech firms that are largely US based have to report under the same requirements. The Americans have always been very quick to penalise and fine people for malpractices and misuse of stuff, as had the European Union. Uh, yes, it all might be a bit headliney. Let's take, for instance, Apple's tax bill in Ireland. Um, but we have it's like an ammonium bug, right? You know, there is going to be climate change. We have to keep it below two percent. Um, so, so things have to be done, and I think they will be. But there will be some rocky road bumps along the way, but I think we'll get there. But I don't think it's a scam. I think these these people are genuinely using ESG, decide who to invest in. And I think what has changed recently is that the people that they're getting their money from, who they're looking after their money half of, I think their viewpoint has changed as well. I think they've become younger and I think that they have um, genuine concerns about where the planet where investment is heading uh, and if they can basically follow the money is what i'm saying as with everything anyway i'm gonna have to make a move so um thank you for your time i think is there any other you guys that uh, anyone want to raise in which case i think we're going to close just one thing, just is John Pastor Wells again. Thank you very much. It's been so amazing. I'd like to reach out to you, uh, to a couple of you to make some uh, uh, to offer some of our insights. But here's the thing: uh, shouldn't there be a business case for people who want to uh, be green in the data center world and uh, lead the way? 
with a marketing policy that has uh, the flag and reach out to you and uh, and set a standard, uh, volunteer, volunteer uh, standard. Would that work? I mean, the ASGN is something along those lines. Is there an opportunity here for somebody to differentiate themselves and appeal to the younger generation or generation, the generations that is care about these things a little bit more? Uh, that's a question. Sorry, thank you very much. Nothing. John, I'm going to answer that question as well, actually, if I may. Um, Google have, are very proud to say they've been climate neutral since 2007, I think, and Microsoft have gone on record saying that they will uh, be offsetting all of their previously historical carbon emissions by 2040, 2050. And I think these are laudable, laudable things to do. Now, if you want proof of the pudding, then we look at data centers like Eco Data Center in Fallon in Sweden. And I noticed that Jonathan's online. So, Jonathan, um, if, if you're still online, do you want to come on and give us a brief overview of, of, of the Eco Data Center in Fallon, which is probably the most energy efficient and sustainable data center? on the planet right now it's it was built using sustainable uh, materials apart from the concrete it uses the weight heat that the data center generates to dry the biomass then put into the um, local district heating system which provides power to the data center and heat for the um, the local community so it really does tick a lot of kind of socially uh, environmental and governance policies. There's a really good team of guys there, and I think they're probably the ones that are the closest to being um, an organisation that can that can freely admit to being truly green with a green viewpoint. Um, but let's let's not knock the data centre industry too much. Imagine if we hadn't been doing all those things that we've done over the last ten years. Right, then you know it could be the energy consumption could be far higher than it is now. Yeah, and it hasn't been. You know, we've reduced. There's an industry metric called PUE, power usage effectiveness, and this is the ratio of the amount of power that goes into the data center against the amount of power that's actually delivered to do the ICT systems. And you know, we can still go to data centers around the world that will be operating at three, four, five. PUE numbers, which is, you know, basically they've got such a low IT load, their supporting infrastructure is using but far that, more energy. Yeah, but but John, just consider for a moment the the, the material science that actually is in, involved in the the design and the build and then that onward operation of that data center. But it's not just about the data center. The data center is there to provide a myriad of services and all of those services consume resources, planetary resources. So whilst you may claim to have the greenest, cleanest, most energy efficient rack of servers, what actually is consuming services at the end of the line could be something which is completely heinous and out of the control of any piece of regulation whatsoever. As people recycle through their phones from an iPhone 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, as they throw around PCs, laptops, you know, the list goes on and on and on, and necessarily using services which don't need to be used. So the thing is, it's as we as we spoke about years ago and the studies which we did with DEFRA all those years ago, it is about it's not just about the data center, it's about all of the other pieces of technology which are used directly or indirectly in the consumption of a service and what leads up to that service being consumed and then the maintenance and the ongoing life of that service. That's a tremendously large call on Earth's resources. It's not just about electricity. And I think if, you, if, you, if people actually have the courage to challenge companies like Google and Apple and all the rest of it, that claim to have these incredibly efficient data centers to actually unpack what they mean by the word sustainable and is it really truly sustainable? I think they would fail miserably to provide any substantive evidences. Uh, Which is, is what I. Is it possible to bring Jonathan on? I, I think, you, uh, John, you said he was 
present to talk about his data center. Is he there? He's definitely there now, yes. He's still still an attendee and he's clearly listening because he hasn't got the inattention uh, up. So, Jonathan, can you switch to Bring you up? No, he's self muted. He's self muted. Self -muted. Oh, okay. Can we hear you, Jonathan? Would you like to speak? You're on mute. No. Uh, uh, John, uh, I think you said you had to rush away fairly shortly. Well, I, I'm, it's only dinner, so. Um... Yes. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> uh, so that's what my daughter is um, pestering me to take her to McDonald's. So. Oh well. While the, while the wife's away, the um, the mice the will play. play. <laughs> um, I just, yeah, I just want to make one final point before I go. You know, Greenpeace did trigger a lot of debate in the industry about using um, renewable energy. And in the UK, from from the climate change uh, agreement data, we understand that it's about seventy nine percent of data centers energy use is derived from renewable energy sources likely to be on green tariffs ppas and you'll see that there is a lot of uh, media chatter from the organizations that they're using 100 percent renewable energy and that applies to people like Vertiv, it applies to people like direction drt equinix they all talk about the um, use of renewable energy and that's absolutely fine. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Mm. But we are, you know, the industry itself it is quite alarmed that it's being targeted in this way. And, you know, to be honest, more energy is wasted in the production of steel and cement and logistics, uh, especially uh, ship emissions, transport emissions. And they're quite alarmed that they're getting unfairly targeted about this. Uh, but they, I do think that they're slowly but surely um, coming back into uh, the fold. And I think that there will be some movement in terms of becoming more transparent. Um, and, and, you know, not a lot of people know, but they, you know, a lot of these data centers are REM and LEED certified for their data centers, yet they don't score as high as some of the um, has buildings or zero carbon buildings. But you know, a lot of the uh, requirements for REM and LEED are to keep the heat in the building, and data centers do the complete opposite. It puts it wants to get the heat out, so let's capture that heat and use it. Uh, in um, district heating systems or as dry in biomass or in some sort of low heat industrial process. Um, that's great. But you know, the, the real elephant in the room is the ICT equipment and its manufacturing and the rare earths it's using. And that is outside of the responsibility of the data center operators. They are merely homes for data servers. Uh, and the concept that would be would be a data center, co-location data center is effectively a car park for a server. So you wouldn't see a car park operator moaning about the fact that some big eight liter V8 monster engine in a car has just gone into his data center and parked up, right? And it's got to be the, if the ICT manufacturers that we need to put the pressure on. They need to consider all of the materials and the period of elements that they're using in the construction of those ICTs. And they need to, I think, they need to start to be able to recover that those resources once you've reached end of life. I was on a very interesting webinar uh, the days ago by the Tadachi project and in a server there are 70% of the server is metals 
7% is plastics, 2.5% are cables, 0.5% uh, are batteries, and 21% of the PCBs. Now, for every ton or five tons of PCBs that are recycled, they have got an industrial process that can recover copper, tin, nickel, lead, tantalum, silver, iridium, gold, and cobalt. Right? We can recover these elements. They have to be done in a properly designed facility. We shouldn't be allowing ICT waste to be put in a container and sent over to developing nations such as East Africa and China and burn off in a flame by a child. Is that still happening? I mean, that was 10 years ago. Still we made no progress on that yet. No progress has been done on it at all. And if we look at um, now, remember that if once a server has reached its end of life, one of the first things that will happen from a security perspective is that they will recover the hard disk drives and they'll just be shredded and dumped into landfill. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, <laughs> I went to see one yeah. of these operators. Yeah. Northern now, now this, this company from a hard disk drive, it can recover copper, tin, nickel, neodymium, tantalum, silver, cobalt, dysprosium, prosado sodium, and gold in viable quantities, right? But obviously, they can't do that if if somebody is basically just shredding it, and chucking it in landfill. So there are there are questions about some security processes in use by the largest users of ICT. They I mean, should but say. The other yeah, point okay. is, John, it's not the other point. Is where are computer manufacturers sourcing their materials? Indeed. Yeah very well recycling stuff or, 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 or yeah. you know, how do they source their materials are we still using the mines in congo you know are we still needing to call that out yes it, because i think the thing bob is until companies until either companies are regulated or they see a competitive advantage in engaging in design for disassembly techniques until the, either one of those two things arises, then they will always go to the cheapest material source within the supply chain. And if that's a mine in the middle of the Congo, then they'll go to that mine. Hmm. That's fair. Um, can I, I think there might be a question actually from uh, Mina. Um, I believe that you've got a question. Could you unmute yourself? You're yeah, well. Um, yeah, I was just... Um... Some interesting comments um, that have been made by the panel there. Um, just wondering um, whether we hire equipment as opposed to buy it. And the, I guess the disruptor would be that all equipment has to be recyclable to a certain percentage as a start. And then, you know, we don't use all the tech that we buy. So, you know, was, is there more of a push towards software as a service and, you know, even technology as a service? So, yeah, once we don't use something, it goes back to who we bought it from or hide it from. Um, and it's for them to actually recycle. And I do agree there needs to be some sort of regulation. Um, otherwise, I just can't see it happening. Hey, well, um, you know that's a great question and um there is some legislation that's going through the eu at the moment which is the right to repair um and i think that's going to have a real real impact on uh manufacturers of ict equipment but knowing them though they'll lobby to get themselves exempted from it uh, and as we know you know you can't repair an iphone 12 um it's a sealed unit um and that, and maybe they're going to have to be some redesign of, of some of the ICT products. The thing is, you know, people want the latest phone every two years uh, and mm. contracts are, are are created. So, I mean, my phone's up for renewal now. And, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, my phone's perfectly good. But, um, mm. you know, do I want to buy the next or do I want to get on my contract the next uh, device? Um, the thing is, these, these phones are relatively cheap. 
and these technology companies, you know, they, they've got to keep running to keep up and they have to bring out some something new every time. Um, and it is a consumer device. It's a fast moving consumer device. Uh, it's a fast moving consumer good. Um, so it, it does have a, an element of, of consumable in it. Um, and, I, you know, yeah, there is a fundamental, there is change needs to be required. And I think that change will come when either the price of the item gets too too large, or it doesn't become a commodity anymore, or there are some regulations around it. And I'm not hopeful that we're going to get either relatively soon. Anyway, I've got to have to make a move. Uh, yeah. okay, so John, can I thank you very much for your presentation um, on behalf of Alex? I think we've lost Alex, but uh, I'd like to just thank you. That presentation was fantastic. Also, uh, the same to Richard. Again, your presentation was amazing. Thank you so much. It was it was wonderful. Um, and can we share uh, them? Can we share the slides, Margaret, somewhere? Yes, uh, John, if you could send me the slides, and if you're happy, I'll put it up. I'll get it put up. Would this be all right with yeah, you? No, yeah, no problem. I'll do that for you. Okay, Thank if you, you send me the slides, then I'll put it up. Um, and uh, the certainly, I'm not quite sure how we can, whether we can actually share the um, Richard, your your one. Uh, I'm more than happy for people to take a copy of that. So um, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll search around and say where it is at the moment, and then. Um, okay. They can contact me and I can actually put you in position if there's a, an issue about putting it up. No, I'm more than happy for people to Any take other it. comments from anyone, in which case we're close the evening? And say thank you very much. Thank you very much for the attendees, which have made it possible, and members of the, the specialist uh, group, as well as the committee and the, the members of the, and those that are not members of the specialist group. If you'd like to join us, we'd love to have you. But anyway, do sign up to receive the information, even if you're not a BCS member. I think this is a very, very important topic. And um, I think it's one that we're going to need to come back to again and again, unfortunately. Uh, I wish we were, but I think we were. So thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Bob, for joining us. And thank you, particularly, all those that have been on the fun. So thank you very much. Thank Great you. to see you all again. Lovely to see you. Keep going. Yeah. Thank you. Bye all. All yeah, the best. We can do Take it. Care. Bye. Bye. I'll close this down. Great to see you, Margaret. Bye. Bye-bye. All the very Thank best. You.